ونصل الآن إلى الجلسة الأخيرة في هذا المنتدى والتي تتعلق دائما بالدور الذي يلعبه التحول الرقمي في إعادة تصميم صناعة التمويل الإسلامي وفي هذه الجلسة سأدعو السيدة كنزة بنيس للالتحاق بالمنصة لتسيير هذه الجلسة ودعوة المتحدثين للنقاش شكرا لك أيها السادة السلام عليكم What a room. Very good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kinza Benis. I'm a communication strategist and e-learning expert, and I'm delighted to be with you, with you today. So as every internet entrepreneur, I am fascinated by the craze around crypto and blockchain. And so as I'm launching in a few days, in e-learning platform, I was wondering, wouldn't it be amazing if I could launch an ICO to have a crypto, a halal crypto that learners could, that could exchange against their halal products and services once they learn the skills. But then a million doubts and questions popped out of my mind. Will crypto ever be a thing, really? Isn't it just an institutional tool for now? I mean, as, Islamic, as far as Islamic finance is concerned, I have only heard about blockchain, sukuk, wakf. So crypto is not mainstream yet. So maybe it's too early, or is it too late? Considering today, it is almost impossible to launch a crypto with the a successful coin with the right network effects. So today, we are all wondering what possibilities does the Islamic finance ecosystem offer, really? Uh, what fintech initiatives that did ICD uh, get involved in so far? What industries can successfully use uh, halal cryptocurrencies? Does the regulatory framework uh, facilitate uh, innovative initiatives? Like you, lucky me, today's panelists have the answers. I would like to call on Marilyn Hybe, co-founder and CEO of BetterVest. Abdullah Khan, co-founder of HLC, a blockchain-based halal chain company. Mohammed Maher al Manai head of Islamic Finance Institutions program, and Hubert de Vauplan, partner at Kramer Levin Naftalis. There we go. Lovely, lovely to have you with us today. So, I would like to start uh, with the basics. Abdullah, does your microphone work? Yeah, no? Did you find a button? I'm starting with you. <laughs> yeah, it's working. So, Abdullah, yeah, yeah, it is. Bismillah rahman rahim so I want, I want to start with the basics, and I want, to, I want to ask you, can you explain what cryptocurrency and blockchain is, and how it can serve Muslim consumers? And uh, the question you are asking is very simple and basic but actually it's very complicated to explain something that is sophisticated in a simple manner. Uh, for me, like uh, uh, in terms of blockchain, I I'm trying to explain from five different verticals. Firstly, it is a distributed ledger that is going to uh, allow uh, a peer-to-peer -peer transaction uh, without the involvement of third party. All right, so it is a distributed uh, ledger uh, system this is from the first layer. 
And from the second uh, uh, verticals, and, and uh, I think like blockchain is a truster create machine in our society to create the, the truster to enable the, uh, the, the transactions uh, in the peer-to-peer -peer labor. And apart from that is I think uh, blockchain uh, it's also a tokenization mechanism that is going to encourage the participation from all the industrial stakeholders to release the full potential of the economy. Uh, this is from first layer. The fifth layer that is uh, blockchain, uh, uh, the previous generation internet is internet of to help us to exchange information. And uh, blockchain is a new technology to help you to exchange the value, to transfer the value. Uh, so I believe that blockchain, simply speaking, is the internet of value. Last year, but not least, year, because I have been into the blockchain and cryptocurrency, and I have a lot of communities from Africa across various jurisdictions, and I have to say, blockchain is not only a simple technology, and also is, it stands for the minted power in the new digital economy, uh, and also, it is kind of instrument uh, to redefine your business model and also to redefine your uh, social structures. Uh, this is uh, uh, how I understand blockchain. And in terms of cryptocurrency, crypto asset, uh, it is very controversial and hot topics uh, globally. Uh, I think uh, uh, crypto, crypto asset is a distributed and decentralized uh, uh, asset against the like, centralized uh, fiat money that is issued by the bank. Uh, and also, uh, we need to distinguish what is a uh, crypto asset and also what is token. Token is issued on the second layer. The first layer is public chain. The public blockchain is a uh, crypto asset, and the second layer applications is a token. Uh, this is what I see, understand what is cryptocurrency, what is blockchain, and what is tokens. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Mohammed Al Manai, can you complete about how cryptocurrency and blockchains can serve Muslim consumers? And yeah, and go on with um, how, what issues does it tackle, and how we, uh, Islam finance can tackle the more issues in, in fintech. Is, is, uh, Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum everybody. And uh, I thank, I mean, our partners to come here, especially today to sign with us the MOU to launch this platform of 100 financial institutions. And it's part of our discussion today. And really, I mean, to reach out all our member countries and our clients and SMEs in our member countries. Uh, talking about, I mean, the issues in Islamic finance. We have a lot of issues in Islamic finance. And as you know, Islamic finance still, it's at the infant kind of stage compared to the conventional, uh, conventional finance. I can list down three main I mean, issues nowadays. I mean, we can, we can see through our sensors. As you know, those 100 financial institutions in our member countries, they are kind of sensors to tell us what kind of issues we are facing uh, in, in Islamic finance. And I can start right away with the liquidity management. I mean, since I mean, the launching of the Islamic finance, Always, I mean, liquidity management's been one of the main issues uh, in the Islamic banking and Islamic financial kind of uh, sector. Because conventional Islamic banks, they cannot deal with, uh, with uh, central banks, and they cannot deal with conventional banks. And as you know, uh, the main principles of Islamic uh, finance prohibited and uh, prohibiting uh, dealing and exchanging money uh, with money except in the, I mean, what we call them in mean, exchange uh, uh, on spot. Uh, this, we can see nowadays that the, the, the solution is coming out with fintech solutions and with, with, with the blockchain kind of solution. Because to, to manage this liquidity and to link central banks and conventional banks with Islamic banks, you need a commodity market because in Islamic finance, it's, I mean, uh, asset-backed kind of investment. You need always an asset. So to manage this liquidity, you need a huge amount of assets. And we launched a product called Commodity Murabah through Tawarra. 
And it turned out that all those, I mean, uh, platforms, they are using kind of faxes. Some of Sharia, I mean, members, they went and they check it if there is real kind of commodity with this big amount in the storage of those suppliers and wholesales. But it turned out there is really nothing and related to this big amount of tons and millions of, of, of money. So that's why there is a big need to create kind of digital platform where we can transfer the commodities easily and can, I mean, come up with a big amount of commodity versus, I mean, the huge amount of, uh, of money exchanged. This is one of I mean, the big issues and I think FinTech can provide, I mean, a good solution for this. The second issue, as I know, I mean, as you know, I mean, this is for Islamic finance and for conventional is the financial inclusion. For example, ICD, 50% of our member countries, they are, I mean, kind of uh, fragile uh, economies. So the majority of population, they are unbankable and uh, under uh, kind of bank. So we need kind of solutions, developed solutions, sophisticated solution to reach out those population. And as you know, one of the solution is the crowdfunding nowadays that, I mean, we are working on and really to reach out those, those kind of population. The third, and I can see one of the complex and complicated issues in Islamic finance nowadays, is the clearing and settlement process. Because Islamic banks, they are disconnected. They are not really there, they are spending a lot of money, a huge amount of money with a huge amount of time to, to get to this process. And I think uh, coming up with a blockchain solution, it will facilitate this, uh, this kind of connection among the Islamic banks and it will help uh, them to come up with one platform where they can clear and uh, they can, I mean, uh, make it easier, the, the clearing and settlement uh, kind of process. All right, so, so far, uh, to what extent ICD contributed to digital transformation of the private sector and can you tell us about um, concrete examples of initiatives in the fintech you, get, you got involved in? Thank you very much. With the coming of the new management, ICD really now they are focusing more and more on fintech. Uh, as we speak, we have a big division now within ICD, their job and their task only fintech, working on fintech. They are acting as incubator and accelerator for those uh, uh, big initiatives, fintech initiative, blockchain solutions to enable and equip our member countries and our partners with this technology because our role, as you know, ICD, we are uh, to develop uh, the economies and to develop the private sector. Develop private sector, we need to, to equip them with the tools and the latest technology really to, to, to uh, I mean, to develop and to boost their, their economies. We have a lot of initiatives as, as we speak now. We can I mention a few of them. We have, uh, now we are working with a leading uh, company in uh, Switzerland. Uh, they are one of the leading blockchain kind of academy to launch uh, the first Islamic uh, blockchain academy where we are gonna kind of use it as a reverse linkage to equip our member countries with this uh, kind of accelerator and to launch those academies within our member countries. And we are in advanced uh, discussion with, uh, with our partner and in new, due time, inshallah, we'll be announcing this, this big initiative. Uh, the second initiative, we are working to tackle this, this issue because ICD, as uh, uh, Brother Ayman uh, announced already, we are, I mean, our portfolio, 100 financial institutions, of which we have 88 banks. So the liquidity management, it's one of the biggest issues we have in, in ICD. We are working now with different partners in different countries to launch a digital platform where you can, I mean, uh, exchange goods, I mean, and to uh, proceed with the commodity murabha, real commodity murabha transactions, not uh, commodity murabha based just on faxes and, and, and SWIFT. The third initiative we are working, I mean, uh, with better vest here now to, uh, to launch an Islamic crowdfunding platform. Now they have, they will be talking about, they will be presenting their, their platform. But we are working together to extend on this platform and to use it uh, as a bridge to other member countries in Islamic way. We are working with them on Islamic kind of 
uh, crowdfunding kind of platform. And inshallah, she will be presenting uh, the, their, their company and we are working closely to, to launch uh, soon this initiative. But at ICD, we are not a uh, kind of IT uh, company or fintech uh, kind of institutions. ICD, we are using those tools to enable and to, to equip our partners with latest uh, solutions. So always we are looking for the added value. We are chasing the initiatives to add value, to contribute. Not because everybody is working now on crowdfunding, we are working on crowdfunding. But what we are uh, doing now currently, we are, I mean, setting up the layout of partnership with BetterVest is how to use those 100 financial institutions to co-finance with the crowdfunding, to come up with a kind of guarantee fund to, uh, to, to, to boost their, I mean, kind of uh, 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 transactions and to, to give them, uh, to give the crowds more uh, comfort, really, I mean, to transact th through this, uh, this platform. And also we are trying uh, to, to, to deal, yesterday we had a very good meeting with JICA. I mean, they are providing the technology and facilities to use technology in Japan and to use it to connect all those components. And this is our role. As you see, as per the logo of ICD, you see around the sea of ICD a lot of dots. Those dots are partners and our role is to connect those partners. Uh, also, in the same time, we are working on uh, uh, launching uh, a kind of halal food uh, blockchain uh, with our partners as well. He will be introducing this, I mean, uh, uh, kind of partnership. In the same time, uh, we are, uh, this, this, this initiative, big initiative, to have 100 financial institutions within one platform, digital platform, it's the infrastructure for a future blockchain, because this is the first step. The second step, blockchain, you need different servers from different countries. It will be serving as a platform and as infrastructure for launching uh, a blockchain technology to, uh, to come up with a solution for this clearing and settlement uh, process for the Islamic uh, banks. Those are few, and inshallah in the due time we'll be announcing other I mean, initiatives. Thank you very much. We always forget about the microphone. Well, that's excellent. And I would like to focus on these crowdfunding solutions. And we asked Marilyn to come up with um, figures about the spectrum of existing uh, crowdfunding and blockchain solutions. And hopefully you can, you can tell us more about what is the size of Islamic uh, finance uh, or in the industry. So first of all, I want really to thank ICD for the invitation to speak here. I'm really very much honored and I believe that crowdfunding and Islamic financing really belongs together because it has the same goals, which is social impact and ethic goals. And yeah, I have a little presentation. I don't know if it works, so I will test it. Yeah, it works, perfect. I mean, first of all, I think that many of you know what is crowdfunding. Who knows what is crowdfunding? Who could re raise their hand? Yeah, most of you, but still some don't know it so deeply, so I wanted to explain. Crowdfunding finally just means that many people invest into a very concrete project, and it's all done online nowadays. And it's not just investing into a fund where you don't know where the money goes. You, you choose exactly what you want to invest to. And crowdfunding uh, is just the main, um, the main wording for four different kinds of uh, funding systems. So crowdfunding can be also donation. Yeah? Then you just donate your money. It can be equity, so you become a shareholder in the company. Then it can be reward-based. So, for example, if a new company wants to create a new LED bump, bulb, you can invest into the company and you get an LED bulb yourself. And the biggest market is the lending, the crowd lending. And this is also where uh, Better West is active. And when it comes to Islamic financing, um, all of these four systems can be uh, used also in Islamic financing. Clearly, um, when it comes to lending, as an interest rate is difficult um, to manage. Finally, it can be done like um, other crowdfunding platforms who already 
are Islamic conform, they say that at the end there is a certain profit and just the profit will be shared in a certain percentage. So there is no um, promised interest rate, but there is just a share in the profits. And I wanted to bring you some figures also of the crowdfunding. So uh, the crowdfunding market globally grew tremendously. So in 2014, it was already 16 billion US dollar. And then in 2015, it was even expected to be 35 billion. But then the market a little bit stuck, so they did not reach these figures. Uh, these figures then have reached in 2017. The reason is we will also see it in ICOs that clearly at a certain point of time it's very attractive, it's a modern thing to invest into crowdfunding. Lots of platforms come up, but then they have to prove that there can be a secured way of financing. And then also all the markets come up with new regulations. For example, Better West has been funded 2012 in Germany. There was no regulation at all. And then in 2015, we also got regulated. And nowadays, nearly all, uh, you, so all European countries, America, they all have regulations. In Africa, most of the markets are not yet regulated. So here you see the figures of 2017. The figures of 2018 are not yet 100% secure. This is why I show you 2017. And you see here the figures of the four different parts. I mean, do donation, reward-based equity, and lending. And the lending is really the biggest part. And as we also wanted to speak today about ICOs, uh, I also wanted to show you the figures of ICOs. So ICO, so my colleagues can explain you better what it is, but ICO is finally also crowdfunding. ICO means that um, fintech companies, they crowdfund the money that they need themselves to build up the company uh, with, with bitcoins or whatever. And finally, also this market grew tremendously. Yeah. So in 2017, it was 6.2 million, 2018 it was 7.8 million, and finally, it's now also stagnating this market, yeah, and my colleague Han can explain you better why, yeah. Yeah, these were the figures I wanted to show, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, perfect. So we've heard a lot lately in 2017 and 18 about ICOs. It, it, it was so big. Did it uh, finally uh, make crypto go mainstream or are we not there yet? As you like, Abdullah, you want to say something about Hello. All right. In terms of ICO and uh, in terms of uh, STO, and uh, all of the um, new like ways of to raise funds, you know. And uh, mm, I can share some of our experience. Firstly, I was running ICU. And uh, secondly, I, we invested in one, more than 100 ICUs globally. So firstly, ICU is a very effective way to raise funds in a very short period. Uh, it will bring a lot of hot liquidity when a market is very, uh, is very, uh, is very popular, it's very easy to, uh, uh, like to, to introduce a lot of like, liquidity to a project. So uh, I think uh, um, we can look at this one from two perspectives. Firstly, uh, ISU is a very effective ground planning uh, like instrument to bring the liquidity for their uh, startups. And uh, so to enable them to do something uh, in a long-term plan, in a long, a long period. This is the first one. And secondly, and also ISU give a lot of chance for speculation uh, for the uh, capital, give a lot of chance for the speculation for the capital, a lot of hot liquidity, you just want to make profit in a short uh, period. And sometimes actually startups are the victims also of this kind of hot liquidity. Uh, so, uh, but currently I think uh, because in the established market, because uh, I'm doing this ICO in the Chinese market, in the Japanese market, and also South Korea market, which means there are a lot of liquidity when you're doing ICO from the Asian and the uh, United States market. But currently in, the, in this, this part of jurisdiction, I'm talking about like a MENA region, uh, I don't think there is too much liquidity in this part of region, in the ecosystem. We need a lot of awareness 
Even you want to do ISO, you need to bring the liquidity from the other jurisdictions. Like uh, I just met one of the startup company in this afternoon. Uh, they are based in Morocco. They want to do ISO stuff, you know. But I found out that uh, the awareness is very low and they don't have chance to generate liquidity. Uh, so compared to the compared to the traditional venture capitalists, uh, cap uh, venture investment, private equity investment, uh, ISU has its advantages and disadvantages. But one of the biggest disadvantages of ISU doesn't give ownership or security of the project. Uh, when you holding like tokens or the asset, it, uh, it doesn't stand for the ownership of the of this product. This is the first one. So currently, and uh, in the uh, in the Chinese market and in the uh, Western countries, and people are looking at SDO, security token offer at this very moment. So when you are investor in a certain uh, crypto project, uh, it stands for the ownership, and uh, also some time of asset backed project. Uh, it gives more protections to the investors. So I believe the future in the future, SDO is the future, and also asset tokenization is the future, asset backed is the future, and the asset migration from the financial, uh, from the primary market to the second, uh, uh, secondary market is the future. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to switch to French. Uh, I'm just giving some seconds to translate it to adapt. All right. Um, Hubert de Vauplan, vous travaillez beaucoup avec les euh, gouvernements d'État musulmans. Est-ce que vous pouvez nous en dire plus sur la part de la, de la, de la finance islamique dans ces, cette nouvelle, euh, finan, euh, de, ces, nouveaux, euh, ces nouvelles technologies de, de financement Avant de vous poser des questions plus, euh, plus centrées sur la, la régulation. Oui, merci. Bonjour à tous. Euh, on l'a vu dans le panel précédent, il y a des initiatives intéressantes. Vous avez tous noté, par exemple, l'initiative entre la Banque centrale d'Arabie saoudite et celle des États de, de, des Émirats arabes unis pour lancer une crypto-monnaie commune pour les échanges transfrontières entre l'Arabie saoudite et les Émirats arabes unis. C'est une initiative commune intéressante. Euh, une des toutes premières, qui n'est pas spécifiquement focalisée sur la finance islamique, mais qui provient de pays euh, de culture musulmane. Et c'est important de souligner parce que c'est une des toutes premières initiatives, j'en parlerai tout à l'heure, une des toutes premières initiatives de banque centrale pour mettre en place une crypto-monnaie entre deux pays. Donc ça c'est quelque chose de très concret, ça a été annoncé euh, en janvier euh, 2019. Euh, si je peux revenir une seconde sur un point sur, sur les ICO et les STO, on a vu que les chiffres montrés par Marlene étaient, étaient impressionnants. Et puis, on n'a pas les chiffres de 2019, mais on peut déjà vous dire qu'ils sont très mauvais, pour une raison assez simple, c'est qu'il y a eu un coup de frein sur ce mode de financement à cause de la régulation. Puisque, comme ça a été dit par les différents intervenants, Finalement, une ICO, c'est une levée de fonds pour financer un projet. Alors, on va me dire c'est comme le crowdfunding. Oui, sauf que c'est une levée de fonds pour financer un projet, mais non régulé. Or, quand je lève des fonds pour financer un projet, grosso modo, je fais appel public à l'épargne. Ça fait une offre au public. Et le concept d'offre au public, il existe dans tous les pays du monde. Et une ICO, c'était une manière de faire des offres publiques sans passer par la réglementation des offres publiques. Et donc la SEC, essentiellement aux états unis et puis d'autres pays, on en parlera plus tard, ont donné des signaux très forts pour dire qu'à la fin, tous ces tokens qui circulaient, il faut faire la différence entre crypto et token, on y reviendra peut-être tout à l'heure, tous ces tokens qui circulaient, finalement, on devait les considérer comme des securities, comme des valeurs mobilières comme des instruments financiers. Et que si ces tokens étaient des securities, eh bien, ils devaient suivre la réglementation des offres publiques. Et c'est pour cela que le marché est drastiquement tombé, en attendant qu'il se restructure sous forme de STO, comme ça vient d'être dit, c'est-à-dire de securities token offering, c'est-à-dire vraiment de tokens qui représentent des 
des instruments financiers, des valeurs mobilières, et non pas un projet futur plus ou moins évanescent. Voilà, je voulais un peu revenir là-dessus parce que c'était, je pense, important de revenir sur ces, ces éléments. Oui, absolument. Et pour le coup, euh, vous avez parlé d'un frein qui a été la régulation. Quels sont les autres freins de la, du développement des cryptocurrencies Et euh, du coup, je voulais vous demander de, une autre question qui est ben, quel est l'état de lieu des régulations et comment la finance islamique est en train de s'adapter aux régulations Est-ce qu'elle a sa propre régulation alors, quand on parle de régulation, il faut distinguer deux choses. Il faut distinguer la régulation sur les actifs et la régulation sur, entre guillemets, les monnaies. Autrement dit, il faut distinguer ce qu'on ce que, ce qu appelle les, les virtual currency et distinguer les, les, les crypto assets. Ce n'est pas pareil. D'un côté, vous avez une question monétaire, avec les banques centrales qui ont leur mot à dire. De l'autre côté, vous avez une question d'offre au public et de euh, et distribution d'un actif financier. Et d'ailleurs, on le voit bien, puisque euh, si je prends les cas de l'Europe, euh, il y a eu des papiers qui sont sortis au mois de janvier par les régulateurs européens bancaires d'un côté, et puis euh, valeurs mobilières, marché financier de l'autre, et qui adressent les questions de manière très différente. Et donc, quand on regarde du côté monétaire, euh, vous avez deux institutions internationales qui ont aussi sorti des papiers, qui sont le FMI d'un côté, et puis BIS, BRI, la Banque des Règlements Internationaux, de l'autre côté. Et c'est assez curieux de voir que ces deux institutions ne sont pas exactement sur la même longueur d'onde. La Banque des Règlements Internationaux, à Bâle, qui est la banque des banques centrales, en quelque sorte, a une vision très très prudente et conservatrice sur le sujet des cryptos, et euh, en tant que monnaie, et, et plutôt en train de souffler un peu le froid. De l'autre côté, le FMI, euh, dit « mais vous ne pouvez pas, vous, Banque Centrale, ignorer ce qui se passe au niveau des cryptos. Et vous devez bien vous interroger, vous, Banque Centrale, dans quelle mesure vous ne pouvez pas vous-même émettre des cryptos. » Donc on voit qu'il y a des réflexions qui sont liées à la politique monétaire, qui sont beaucoup liées aussi à la politique de change et au contrôle des changes, qui influent sur le sujet. Quant à du côté des, 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 des instruments financiers, qu'est-ce qu'on voit On voit beaucoup de pays... Alors, euh, j'ai noté que dans les Émirats Arabes Unis, euh, ils sont en train de publier dans les prochains jours euh, une régulation sur les ICO, mais la plupart des pays sont en train de sortir des régulations sur les ICO. La France est en train de le sortir, le, euh, un certain nombre de pays sont en train de le sortir aussi. Le Japon a modifié sa réglementation, là, cette année, passant d'ailleurs du concept de virtual currency à virtual assets, pour bien montrer que ce n'est pas pareil. Euh, Hong Kong a fait pareil. Singapour a fait pareil, euh, donc euh, je ne parle pas des plus petits pays euh, comme Malte, Liechtenstein, etc. Donc on a une régulation qui est en train d'arriver pour distribuer des, 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 des asset tokens, des, des, des tokens qui sont assis sur, des sur quelque chose de tangible, et alors maintenant je fais le lien, c'est là où on va pouvoir trouver le lien avec la finance islamique, parce que tant que votre token n'avait rien de, de concret, ben, ce n'était pas très euh, charia compliance en quelque sorte. Le jour où votre token est assis, sur quelque chose de concret, sur un actif concret, du moment que ce ne soit pas un actif sous forme de dette, bien sûr, mais sur un actif concret, vous pouvez tokeniser plein de choses. Et les projets qu'on est en train de voir, c'est comment on peut transformer des soukouks sous forme classique en droit anglo-saxon qui sont des trusts, en droit civil qui sont sous forme de titrisation, comment on peut transformer ces soukouks en à la fois un token avec un smart contrat et qui passe par euh, des blockchains pour le règlement de livraison. Et donc, ça, c'est très concret. Je pense qu'on n'a pas besoin de régulation là-dessus, c'est-à-dire que c'est du droit contractuel, où il va suffire de, entre guillemets, hein, de structurer différemment les, 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 les sous-cooks, et ça va permettre de baisser le coût d'émission des sous-cooks, et ça va permettre de démocratiser les émissions de sous-cooks au niveau des corporates, et pas uniquement au niveau des banques centrales ou des États. Et c'est ça l'un des challenges pour les prochains euh, mois, pour les prochaines années pour la finance islamique, c'est intégrer ces technologies pour voir comment ces technologies, comme vous le disiez tout à l'heure, euh, Mohamed Maher, comment on peut les, 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 les transformer dans le monde de la finance islamique. Et typiquement, l'émission de Soukouk en est un exemple. On n'a pas besoin de loi, on n'a pas besoin de règlement. Là-dessus, le contrat suffit déjà. Voilà les évolutions par rapport 
à ce monde entre les monnaies d'un côté et les actifs de l'autre. Alors, excellente nouvelle donc, pour la finance islamique. Les cryptos sont, sont totalement en ligne avec l'idée d'avoir des « asset-backed financial products ». Bien, mais vous avez parlé du coup surtout d'instruments institutionnels. C'est ce que j'avais dit en, inst en introduction, hein. on entend parler surtout d'institutionnels. Quand est-ce que ça va arriver au mainstream, qui est l'obsession de Abdullah <rire> et la mienne aussi <rire> Quand est-ce qu'enfin les SMIs, les PME, qui constituent le plus gros du tissu économique des, de, des, des pays, vont pouvoir manipuler effectivement ces monnaies est-ce que ça va arriver Quand Comment Donc, Je reviens sur ma distinction que j'ai faite hein, entre euh, une crypto qui est une crypto asset et une crypto qui est une, une, une crypto monétaire, currency. Donc quand on dit comment les, les SMIs, les PME vont pouvoir utiliser les cryptos, euh, sur la partie monétaire, bah, pas tout de suite, objectivement. Euh, et vous voyons ce qui se passe. Le Maroc, parce qu'on est au Maroc, mais la Chine et d'autres pays ont interdit l'usage de la crypto monétaire, au sens monétaire, c'est-à-dire comme vecteur d'échange et de paiement. Alors il faut juste comprendre pourquoi certains pays ont interdit l'utilisation du bitcoin ou autre. Parce que ça touche à la politique de change, ça touche à la réserve, au problème de réserve de change. Donc cette partie-là, elle est très liée à la politique monétaire des pays. Donc je pense que l'utilisation de crypto comme vecteur monétaire pour les entreprises pour payer euh, des biens ou des services, ce n'est pas demain. Par contre, l'utilisation du mode crypto assis sur un actif pour se financer en, en créant de nouveaux instruments, et c'est là où effectivement on travaille avec quelques, quelques banques centrales ou gouvernements euh, pour voir comment on pourrait transformer des instruments de financement traditionnels en des instruments de financement adaptés au monde des PME, mais totalement digitalisés, euh, et qui puisse servir de mode de, non pas de paiement, mais encore une fois de financement, et assis sur un actif, que l'actif soit l'actif de la société euh, ou, ou, ou autre, là, euh, euh, pour le coup, il faut apporter des modifications législatives dans les pays qui veulent s'inspirer ou adapter euh, cette technologie à leur mode de financement. Je prendrai juste un exemple très très simple pour le Maroc. Vous avez en droit marocain, comme en droit français, ce qu'on appelle des bons de caisse. Des bons de caisse, c'est des vieux trucs qui existent depuis toujours. Euh, c'est typiquement un instrument pour les PME, pour se financer. Mais ça fonctionne comme un chèque, donc ça fonctionne comme grand-papa. C'est-à-dire que pour transférer un bon de caisse, il faut signer derrière le bon de caisse. Alors à l'heure du numérique, c'est pas terrible. Mais il suffit de transformer le bon de caisse de manière numérique, comme on l'a fait en France, pour pouvoir faire du bon de caisse un instrument qui se négocie via la blockchain. C'est typiquement ce qu'on a fait en France. Et du coup... Vous pouvez trouver un instrument totalement ancien que vous relouquez sous format digital et blockchain pour en faire un outil de financement pour les entreprises. Donc ça, c'est du concret. Mais il faut passer par une réglementation, une loi qui adapte des instruments anciens au, euh, euh, au monde digital et au monde de la blockchain. Alors, vous parlez de relooking, c'est intéressant parce que c'est un peu le titre de, du panel, hein, c'est « restyling ». Uh, Islamic finance. Uh, Mohamed Meher Manai, uh, can we leap talk about leapfrogging, go, advancing and going for forward rather than recycling and restyling? Hello. Uh, I took you by surprise, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. So we've been talking about restyling, and uh, Hubert de Vauplan talked about relouqué. Uh, so it's kind of, uh, we're talking about recycling what, is, what already exists, right? Can we, talk about, can we be bolder and talk about uh, innovative ideas that the private sector could come up with and that ICD or other institutions could back? Is there any uh, will uh, or uh, initiatives in this um, uh, In, 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 in this vision. Thank you very much. Uh, I mean, as we speak, no, for the time being, at ICD, uh, we don't have such initiative. But as I said, at ICD, uh, we are chasing any new initiative, any new tool to serve, to help us 
uh, help our uh, end users and SMEs and our member countries. And um, this is an announcement to invite any company that they have any new initiative to work with us. We are a bridge for them to reach out, I mean, the world. I mean, to, through using these 100 financial institutions, it's a, it's, it's a huge kind of platform, really. In 25, four member countries, it's a huge. So any new initiative to help SMEs, any new initiative to, to help banks, I mean, for, for anything related to uh, digitization, uh, crowdfunding, uh, restructuring new products, will be more than happy to embrace, uh, embrace this initiative and work with them as accelerator. We'll, I mean, try to, to provide them with the missing components, okay, to come up with a finalized kind of solution to, uh, to market to, uh, to our member countries. I may add something here. So I was really happy when ICD approached us because um, they said we want to do something for the SMEs. The SMEs, they need the money to invest into renewable energy, energy efficiency. They want to build up their company to, to, to give more people work in the country, on the continent here in Africa. And uh, we have seen the same. So with Better West, we went qu quite early into Nigeria. We are now also in Senegal and in Kenya. And we approach a certain market we, we uh, approach the people who need 50,000 50, euro up to 1 million. And this is a range where the banks normally fail because they say it's too small. So we cannot do the due diligence for a 100,000 euro project. Nevertheless, the typical SME doesn't need 10 million. He needs 100,000, yeah? And um, so when we went to Nigeria, we have been approached by a German GIZ because they said no Nigerian bank can give the loan for our mini grid projects that we give a grant of 50% to. So we said it's a big pity. So we started to crowdfund and we have seen that even the European investors, they love to invest because they said, uh, when I give a donation, I'm not sure if this project is really economically feasible. But if you invest and you get promised that you get a certain interest rate or a prof profit, a share of profit, then finally you know that that must be a business case. If anyway, crowdfunding platforms, they do a due diligence on the economics and on the technical side. But what I want to say, many people here in audience are from banks, and I can really just say that the combination of crowdfunding and bank is perfect because SMEs come to you and you cannot help them. So you can send them to the crowdfunding platform. On the other hand, the crowdfunding platform get approached by companies who need perhaps two, three million, and we say this is too much for us. So you can get the senior loan from the bank and we just crowdfund the equity you need. Yeah? And this is also what happens now in Europe. So, for example, there is GLS Bank, a very big ethical bank. They have their own crowdfunding platform. Or we from Better West, we got the shareholder Triodos Bank, which is a Dutch uh, ethical bank. And so they got now a, sh a share in Better West. So this is a very natural combination that now happens. So we have 20 minutes left for Q&A, unless you want to add anything. Okay. Do you have questions in the audience? Great. Okay. Do, do you have a microphone? Is there someone you could... Thank you. I totally get it in terms of due diligence. But what I've always asked myself with crowdfunding, when you go out there, you have a platform. How, how much due diligence have you done? Because you're going out to individuals who may not have that much money, for whom this is a big investment to make sure their money is safe. The second one um, is going to the uh, two applications of crypto. Um, totally get it. Tokenization, Skook absolutely works. See it. Um, when I look at the um, crypto as a currency, as a money, as a, as a payment method, um, it's incredibly, it's been incredibly volatile for obvious reasons. Um, from, a, from a development banking perspective, I do understand why, let's say, um, Morocco says, no, we, we don't want to go there, and some other countries say we don't want to go there because of the volatility and the inherent risks. From a, from a 
from a development banking perspective, how do you get over that hump? So thank you very much for this question because it's a very good question. This is, I think, also the problem of the crowdfunding platforms why it has been now a little bit stagnating this market. Because we have the problem, the projects are small and we cannot take too much time and too much money to do due diligence that we would be a bank again. So um, we try to res resolve that also by partnering with other institutions that have also this social interest. So for example, the technical due diligence we do together with Engineers Without Borders or with GIZ. So they will do a technical due diligence for a very low cost, so like 2,000 euro for a 200,000 euro project, that's a feasible price. The financial due diligence we do in-house, so we check the cash flow plan of the company, balance sheets, cash flow plan of the project. Clearly you cannot check everything. And so we also try now to build in as much securities as we can. So, for example, we ask even the founders of the company, would you give a private guarantee? Sometimes, legally, it's difficult, but if he says no, then we have also the question mark, do you really believe in yourself or in the company? But a much better thing is what Mr. Manai said. We are now more and more talking to organizations that give uh, some kind of bonds, risk mitigation bonds. They're also the African Guarantee Fund, because they can take a part of the risk, because the problem is, we need the crowdfunding money for the small SMEs and the medium-sized SMEs that are just growing now to be big and professional. But if we want to be 100% secured, we would just only finance the big ones, but they don't need the money. So what can we do? We have to build in securities that perhaps come from NGOs or from other organizations. If I may, just I mean to add on what you just, I mean, advance it. I mean, this is the role of ICD. Now with, with Better Vest, we are trying to come up with a sophisticated or advanced kind of uh, platform, a crowdfunding platform. We are trying to associate this platform with our banks in the regions, because now, for example, the case of Better Vest, they are collecting, I mean, from the crowds money to invest and to fund projects in Africa. I mean, we have now more than 42 banks in Africa. They are on ground. They know the market. They know the clients. We can associate those banks with this crowd in terms of co-financing, in terms of, I mean, custodian, I mean, kind of services. We are trying to find, I mean, ways how to have them associating and working together to yield better results, to come up with better solution for our SMEs. This is what always trying to do. Also, as I said, part of this risk, we are trying with ISFD to come up with SME uh, kind of a guarantee fund for crowds, okay, to give them more comfort, comfort to go more for the leverage and to, co to go more for the risks that we are talking. Sometimes they are uh, uncovered and uh, that we cannot really cover them, let's say, not just uncover it. Thank you. Um. La question des monnaies est toujours compliquée que quand on parle monnaie, derrière on pense banque centrale. Alors je vais prendre un exemple qui soit très parlant pour tout le monde et qui est un exemple concret, c'est l'annonce récente de Facebook d'émettre le Facebook coin. Bon, ça veut dire que vous on va pouvoir payer un certain nombre de choses sur Facebook à l'intérieur de la communauté Facebook. J'ai employé un mot fort à l'intérieur de la communauté Facebook. C'est-à-dire que le Facebook coin, il n'a de valeur que sur le réseau Facebook. Il n'a pas de valeur en dehors du réseau Facebook. Vous ne pouvez pas payer vos impôts avec le Facebook coin. Vous ne pouvez pas payer euh, votre boulanger avec le Facebook coin. Pourquoi je suis en train de prendre cet exemple Parce que si on, on, on réfléchit finalement à une institution comme euh, ICD ou, ou, ou euh, IDB et, et, et les cryptos, on pourrait voir deux applications possibles, avec le parallèle qui n'est pas le bon avec Facebook Coin. Facebook Coin, pour moi, le grand problème, c'est grosso modo, on en parlait tout à l'heure ensemble, c'est un jeton du club méditerranéen, si vous voulez. C'est-à-dire, c'est quelque chose qui... Enfin, c'est un coquillage. C'est quelque chose qui n'a de valeur qu'à l'intérieur d'une communauté. Il n'y a pas de planche à billets derrière. Il n'y a pas de pouvoir d'émission. Il n'y a pas de pouvoir libératoire, au sens juridique du mot. Par contre, qu'est-ce qui pourrait être intéressant dans une crypto pour une institution de finance islamique comme euh, euh, la BID et, et la CID ben, Deux choses. Quand euh, euh, la CID, la Société Islamique des Développements, 
déploie des, euh, des, des, des lignes de financement auprès de banques euh, à travers le monde. Elle les déploie euh, en euros ou en dollars. Et après, après avoir déployé ces euros ou ces dollars dans les banques, il faut les convertir, et ensuite ça passe dans des murabaha euh, avec des PME locales. La grande question, c'est de s'assurer que le travail que font les banques euh, correspond bien au cahier des charges que demande euh, l'ACIDE, notamment dans tout ce qui concerne le type de financement accepté au niveau charia. Si vous mettiez une traçabilité euh, de l'ACIDE jusqu'au financement, sous forme d'une monnaie qui pourrait être utilisée euh, de l'ACIDE jusqu'à euh, la PME lorsqu'elle va à la fin acheter son tracteur, vous pourrez vous assurer quelque part, c'est un sujet que je dis pour l'ACID, mais qui est vrai pour euh, toute agence de développement fondamentalement, c'est-à-dire les, les questions des agences de développement, c'est de s'assurer de la traçabilité entre le financement et l'utilisation avec un coût de change le plus faible possible. Et donc ça, une monnaie, je n'ose pas employer ce mot, un jeton, une monnaie qui, enfin une crypto, voilà, pour prendre un mot neutre, qui serait utilisée par l'ACID, aurait déjà ce premier avantage. Deuxième avantage, elle pourrait réduire le risque de change. Pourquoi Parce qu'on pourrait faire finalement une crypto-monnaie émise par l'ACID qui soit un stablecoin. C'est-à-dire qui fondamentalement soit assise sur d'autres paniers de monnaie ou quelques paniers de marchandises de telle manière à réduire le risque de change entre le moment où les lignes de financement sont mises en place et le moment où les lignes de financement sont déployées. Donc on peut très concrètement dire mais effectivement l'ACID comme la BID elle finance des projets publics ou privés. Et son sujet, c'est fondamentalement de s'assurer de la traçabilité et, et, et du respect chariatique de ces financements avec un coût de change qui soit quasiment égal à zéro parce que ce n'est pas ni la CID ni la BID qui vont prendre le coût de change. Et bien ici, les stablecoins, les coins, les cryptos peuvent être des réponses concrètes qui pourraient être, être étudiées, c'est une suggestion que je fais, hein, qui pourraient être étudiées pour dire « Mais pourquoi ne pas utiliser ces instruments demain ?» comme instrument de finance islamique, bien évidemment, pour les besoins de financement de la CID et de la BID en tant que finance islamique. Ça, c'est en tant que euh, euh, financeur, et puis comme je l'ai déjà dit tout à l'heure, je le répète, cette fois-ci, c'est comme le financeur a besoin de se financer lui-même, quand la CID émet un soukouk, ça lui est arrivé, parce qu'il y a un programme à Londres, elle pourrait penser à le faire, là aussi, sous un format de tokenisation. Puisque notamment quand on fait un soukouk wakala, ce qui est le cas justement du soukouk de l'acide, on voit très bien l'avantage d'avoir une traçabilité finalement dans un soukouk wakala. Et ça, la blockchain avec un smart contrat pourrait permettre d'avoir cette traçabilité. Donc on voit qu'il y a plein d'usages possibles dans le monde de la finance islamique, puisque justement ce qui est intéressant ici, c'est cette traçabilité, cette transparence en quelque sorte que l'on a, c'est l'un des avantages, l'un des, des critères primordiaux de la finance islamique. Et bien là, la blockchain, les cryptos peuvent apporter des réponses très concrètes, automatiques et quelque part à un moindre coût à ces les financements. So we have five minutes left. Do you have any other question? We have a room for one question. Yes. Yes, Mehdi Bogataya from Abay Consulting. My question is about uh, if in case we have this uh, cryptocurrency, uh, Sharia, Sharia compliance, and it goes, as we've seen with cryptocurrencies before, it goes into speculation. And this speculation will, anyhow, it's gonna get away this real value of the crypto assets of the cryptocurrency and get away and uh, then we may have this problem with each Sharia compliance. How are you going to deal with that? I will answer on a pure legal point of view. Sorry to switch in English, but as you ask me in English, I will answer in English is better. Uh, I will never answer on the Sharia side because <laughs> I am not competent at all. Uh, but as a pure uh, lawyer, uh, you are perfectly right. Uh, the main risk for the crypto is the speculation. But why we do have speculation on the crypto? Because those cryptos are listed in, 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 in platform where anyone, you and me, can buy and sell those cryptos. If you reduce the possibility to buy and sell, 
is at the end of the day, the crypto is, 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 is you can access to the crypto only within the, 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 the a, a community, in this case, the community of, uh, of uh, IDB group. And you don't list the crypto in a platform, because why you will need the crypto in a platform? No need to, 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 to list a crypto in a platform. In this case, uh, the crypto will be less subject to speculation, and I suppose in this case, but I am not uh, a scholar again, it will potentially comply more with the charia that uh, the, user, the other crypto, which are for me totally not uh, charia uh, compatible due to the speculation. I don't know if I answer to your question, but for me is clearly if we limit the possibility to access to the crypto, you have less speculation or potentially no speculation. Thank you everyone for this fascinating discussion. Um, if you have a question, if you still have questions, please uh, share them on social media uh, using the hashtag ISDBAM44. I'm sure the panelists will be happy to answer them. And um, that's it. We can wrap the discussion. Thank you so much. <laughs>